My father was the biggest influence of my life. He wasn't judgmental, but he had big expectations for me. And that's a real, that's the center of my being is approval. And when somebody, when I disappoint people, that is the hardest thing in the world for me because I'm so centered in, if you don't approve of me, that means you don't like me and I wasn't a good girl. And everybody, Jordan Murphy here again with another episode of Breakthroughs with Jordan Murphy, conversations about the defining moments that shape our lives. I just wanted to check in and also I kind of realized that people have been responding very favorably to the podcast and I'm so incredibly grateful for that. Um, But I've also realized that I've never really come right out at least on the podcast, because in person I'll shamelessly plug it all day long. <laughs> but but I've not on the podcast come right out and said, if you are enjoying this show, do me a favor and, and share it. Tell other people about it, share the link with them and rate it, review it. And that and that's only if you like it. You know what I mean? I mean, obviously if you don't like it, you can comment on it as well. I'm happy to hear everybody's view. But If you like it, if you are enjoying the conversation that I'm having with people, the only way other people are going to hear about it is if they hear about it from you. So now on with the show. Today's episode is sponsored, as usual, by Amazon Fresh and Audible. Both of these are limited time offers that are available on my website. You get two free downloads on Audible, and you also get a $25 credit towards Amazon Fresh. Both really great products, obviously, or else I wouldn't be talking about them. But (laughs) anyway, and, you know, I also wanted to say that if, and I say this at the end of the podcast, and I'm, I don't know, I wonder, like, do people actually listen to the very end once I say goodbye to my guest? Uh, Maybe not. So I thought I would put it up front also. And that is, if you have a story, which I'm sure many of the people or everybody who's listening to this podcast does, if you have a really great story, a really great breakthrough experience that you'd like to share, do me a favor and go to the website, breakthroughswithjordanmurphy.com and shoot me an email and just give me an abbreviated version of the story. And then I'm going to go through the ones that I get and maybe I'll email you back and say, Hey, I'd like to interview you. So why not? Right. Let's make this thing kind of interesting and fun. Today, I have a really great guest. Now, you know, I always say that. I always have great guests. But this one's, <laughs> this one is, this one's unique, okay? Uh, Marianne Coran Goen is my guest today. And uh, she, uh, she, she hails from Maryland. She's a native of Maryland and an, an alum of the Ground Links comedy troupe. She's uh, appeared on Malcolm in the Middle, Big Love. She's also portrayed Hillary Clinton, Sarah Palin, and Martha Stewart on the Jay Leno's show. And... Uh, for the last six years, she co-hosted a morning radio show called Bob and Marianne Radio with her husband, Bob, on Warm 8 98, Warm 98 in Cincinnati. Every time I say Cincinnati, I think I want to say WKRP. But anyway, <laughs> and she and I, this is, the, this is the kind of unique piece of this. She and I spent four years, 120 episodes, co-hosting a series on USA. What is that about? Anyway, uh, Marianne, how are you? Hello, Jordan. I'm great. It's so nice to hear your voice. I can't believe it's been so long since we've worked together. I know. I know. And, you know, we we worked a while together and we actually worked together from not knowing each other from Adam. I mean, right. you and I talked briefly about this when we spoke last week and uh, the conversation we had last week, I wish we had recorded. Right. But, um, <laughs> but, but, Ain't that the truth? but, but you and I met at a callback for the series that ultimately was the show that we got cast on. Yep. We got 12 episodes and then it was, oh, we'll do another 13 episodes and then another another 13, another 12. I mean, so it was kind of this ongoing gift that kept on giving. Hey, it was, yeah, it was a nice, nice little run we oh, had. It was such a great gig. And, you know, it was interesting though, because you and I met literally in that casting room. Oh, I remember it like it was yesterday. We, uh, I... <laughs> was really digging into you um i kind of just 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 went at you and and about your single life and and uh things like that and uh, you know just giving you just totally razzing you yeah and you were you were kind of taken back by it for a minute but then you went with it and we got the job so yep (laughs) 
something <laughs> something worked. No, something worked. We we had a really great time. I mean, I look back on that and I think it's kind of a bummer because it kind of it came at a time when YouTube and all the availability of having that kind of content stored in the cloud somewhere wasn't mm-hmm. present yet. So no. finding that content, accessing that content, now you have to have it on some like plastic tape that is in our garage, in our memorabilia bins, you know, <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's um, with the dust, you know, that was when they had movies like a uh, Lindsay Wagner uh, movies of the week <laughs> airing exactly. on USA. It was a fledgling yeah. network. Yep. But um, we had a great but time, I though. I guarantee you that I have demo tapes that are on wider tape than yours. <laughs> um, Beta? Yeah. You know, they started out at like two inch and then everything <laughs> went down to three quarter inch. And Bob and I have so many boxes of that stuff in the basement. Uh, what I've always wanted to do with it, though, is I've heard of a friends of ours who have um, viewing parties where you bring the worst thing you ever did wow. when you were starting out. And for me, it would be corporate videos. Sure. And when I had big curly poodle 80s hair oh, and yeah. and the big shoulder uh, suit coats, you know, like yep. Dynasty. Yep. And I going back, but you could find a machine to run them on. That's the problem. <laughs> that is the problem. That is the problem. Um, I, I think I remember I was it's funny. I was talking to a, another guy who I was interviewing. Michael Truco, who is also a, a working actor, and he and I went to college together, and we actually happened to, speaking of one of those like pieces of content from back in the you know the dark ages, was right. we, he and I did a corporate video together for Sears or something like that, and oh, it, or Banana Republic or something like that, and it was one of those corporate videos training you how to deal with sexual harassment. Uh huh. <laughs> yep. Like, that was yeah. That was our. The, that's. The w- the one I really want to get my hands on was the funniest day of my life. It was back in, in the Maryland area and myself and several gals that I you know, was in those circles with in those days all got cast to do a training video to help train prison wardens wow. uh, who deal with female inmates. So we all had <laughs> like inmates. OK, picture this. Five suburban women from Maryland who are you know, just completely clueless about violence and crime in our little orange jumpsuits. And I was supposed to be the tough prisoner who was picking on one woman and kept making her cry. She was afraid of me. <laughs> so I decided to be So it was typecasting. Type yeah, I would roll up a pack of cigarettes in my sleeve <laughs> and have my bra strap hanging out. And then they told us, they every single woman in the room got a makeup bag out. And they the producer went, no, 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 ladies. You're prisoners. Yeah. You don't wear makeup. No, no. And all of us were... What, what do you what do you mean? We're not, we're not going to have makeup on in this. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I had to make Susan Allen back cry. I'll never forget that. And um, how I did that with a straight face I, to get a hold of that would be hilarious. Yeah, that's good content. You know, what's always funny yeah. to me is how when we recall people from our past, like whether it's right. high school boyfriends or girlfriends or college or we always remember them as their full name. It's yes. never it's never Bob. <laughs> Or Jason or Catherine. Yeah. It's Catherine and Sullivan. That's true. <laughs> Jason Santucci. Yeah, it's like the full name. Yep. I, what is that phenomenon? I don't know what it is. It's like somehow that's how the file is saved. So that's yeah, how we recall it. It's got to be long term memory. I don't I know guess. what else it would be. I guess. Yeah. But it's, a, it's an interesting thing. You, anytime you ask anybody to recall their first love in high school, their first kiss, whatever it is, it's going to be a full name. So, all right, let's talk. Uh, let's see. There's so many things that you and I could talk about. Obviously, I think what is right there, hot topic, is what you just kind of came off of with the radio show, number one. And number right. two uh, is obviously just the conversation of the breakthrough conversation. You know, right. what what is that piece that you wanted to share? And you you know what? The floor is yours. If you'd like to start with one or the other, we've got time. Okay. Um the breakthrough thing is, is interesting because everybody has them large or small. Uh, I don't particularly have one top of mind that's like, oh, my God, it was the day that changed my life. There were some close things that almost changed my life, like being on Regis and possibly getting Kelly Ripa's job or actually Kathy Lee's job at the time. Right. That was pretty huge. But it, I, I think for me, the breakthrough that I think helped me so much in my career mainly is, is a smaller thing, a subtler thing that, that happened over time is I learned to be myself in my own skin. 
And the person that I, I've discovered was the person who was in that callback audition with you. I, I was owning myself and owning what I you know, knew I could do, what my strengths were. I wasn't trying to put on a persona. And that who, who were you out. being? Who were you being up to that point? A very presentational person who was thinking, you know, you talk about me being a, a Groundlings alum. And I think my sketch comedy chops are some of the best in the biz. And I say that fully confident, having done it for 25 plus years. Right. But one thing I did not do very well in the Groundlings was improv. I'm very fast on my feet with a one liner in life, you know, within a conversation. But I was always trying to think ahead. And mm. you don't do that in improv and mm. trying to, you know, uh, create the outcome. And I always had a hard time setting up improvs when I was doing sketch early on because I was out in the audience playing a host instead of just being Marianne and not trusting that Marianne is a funny, witty person yeah. who doesn't need to be on. I don't need to be in control of the I'm much better and much funnier and much better what I do if I stop thinking about it so much and just let my instincts go. Well, it, yeah, it's just being present and yeah. and having the courage to be present. And it's scary. It, it's it's not what Very we're scary. trained. It's not what we're trained, conditioned to do. We're always trying to protect ourselves from looking bad. So we're going to try to control the outcome. We're going to try to right. second guess or get out, like you said, be somewhere in the future as opposed to where you're at. And it's, or for God forbid, do something that you did in the past again, you know? Yeah. So being in the present, and this is, you know, I think this is just, this is life, whether it's a groundlings, you know, improv class or not, that's, this is a life experience. I think that we all share. I think we all, right. whether you're going into an interview or you're in a relationship, mm -hmm. we're all uh, grappling with the experience of being present. Yeah, it, it is very much uh, that for me. It was also, you know, that's why I was driven to be uh, more of a character actor, despite people would look at me and go, you're not a character actor. But yeah, yeah, I am. You know, and that's why sketch comedy was so attractive to me in terms of choosing what kind of comedy to do because I could hide behind wigs and costumes and voices and good writing, hopefully, and, you know, mm -hmm. make people laugh. And I, some of the biggest compliments I got, we were doing a tour, a tour, a comedy tour in Washington called Scandal Tours. And each of us played three or four characters during the course of the tour. And I would have, you know, I would be out of costume and out of character, greeting the people coming off the bus and thanking them for being there. And every now and then they would go, well, who are you? And I'd say, well, I was, da, 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 da. that was you? I'm like, yeah, that was me. That was such a feather in my cap. But I, you know, that was a way of hiding me. Um, right. And I still love to do that stuff. But learning to be okay with me and trusting my instincts helped me uh, do well in talk shows and on the game show network and ultimately on the radio jobs. And, you know, I, I am not putting on a persona, you know, and, and it has really helped me in life and in my career. So that, you know, it was a subtle, gradual learning curve. And yeah, being in the present is a, is a great way to emotionally define it. Um, yeah. So that that's uh, that for me, I think, is is a breakthrough. It wasn't like this. Yeah, I did have some aha moments, you know, where where it worked. And I was like, wait, I'm not being presentational. <laughs> you know, right. I'm actually just being Marianne. And you think and that I when and you think that that's you were being the presentational person prior to our show and not so presentational when we started doing the show. Yeah, I think I had come a long way by the time yeah. we had that audition because I had been hosting shows for game show network television right. and doing, you know, a lot of um, I had done a lot of uh, hosting improv to that point where I I would go into the audience and make them laugh as much with me and them before the improv even started. Totally. And, <clears throat> Totally. And get that feeling is just, it's so freeing. I wish I could have been that way auditioning at commercials, but I never figured it out in that, that chapter. So gotcha. they love me. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I remember, you know, uh, I remember us doing the many, many episodes we did, and all we really did was fuck around. I mean, we literally, oh, it was hilarious. Were, we were fun. given like some parameters, say, you know, mm -hmm. hit hit these marks in, right. in the content delivery, um, talk to these uh, guests, whether it was a personal uh, fashion makeover or interior design makeover or uh, cooking makeover. And, and you and I were not experts. We were complete idiots and having right. a lot of fun 
you know, just farting around and making jokes and then actually kind of trying to make the producers who were watching it laugh Mm -hmm. also because they were they were mental also. And so it was literally like we were getting paid to fart around and do product placement. And it literally was you and me just being us. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. It wasn't trying to be anything well, else. Well, yeah, trying to make keeping the guests, you know, from being nervous. Although I, I do love the fact that we had a cooking segment once, and this woman made this beautiful meal, and not knowing she was a nervous wreck, but she pulled it off. And um, I don't, I don't know what she made. Doesn't matter. But um, <laughs> she didn't realize that you had to recreate moments to take certain shots of the finished food. Oh. So when it was done, she just slid it all into the trash. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. It was hilarious. Oh man, there was some, there were some good, there were some doozies on that show. Um, oh boy, some of the interior design ones, and and just you know, it was one of the things that I think that you know, it's weird when you think of like, oh, skills you have, you know, like if you were to ask people like, what are some of the skills you have, right? And you don't think normally about having the skill of being able to put others at ease. You well, know, that's, that's a skill. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you and I basically had to, we would every day, not every day, but every episode, um, we would meet new people who had never been on camera before and right. have to make them feel comfortable. And like, right. there's nothing wrong here. You're going to have a fun time. We're going to have a fun time. And ultimately, we didn't have many, many nightmares. I and mean, we had a couple of people who were a little bit, uh, you know, challenging yeah a little little challenging right or stiff or somebody you just could put you know turn around or right. then you you had you had the money in the bank uh kind of experts like lauren zarian um, yeah, well no kidding yeah uh fashion guy and and i don't know how we got through a day getting anything done because we we just he yeah. and i just made each other wet our pants like the whole time i'm actually yeah. i'm actually wanting to have him as a as a guest um i have I've, I've not reached out to him yet but he's always been great whenever i ask him to participate oh, in something love he's, that uh, guy. He's, yeah. he's he's mental also i mean that was the thing I know, he's a riot <laughs> we were all just idiots and it was uh it was a lot of fun. I'm, I'm, I'm also bummed that it just also wasn't one. Uh, you know, we did it was interstitials. I mean, this was one of those things right. where it came from a yeah. time where it was like we did these 22 minute segments that were chopped up into pieces over like right. an entire day of movies, which was crazy, and then and then it just kind of got whittled down and whittled down, and whittled down. But we never had that really uh, cool opportunity of being able to have something like a show that was like 22 minutes in a row, <laughs> you know, like yes. someone was that watching. Been, that would have been nice. That would have been nice. And we would have crushed something it, that people actually saw. Let's, yes, let's... pretty much like <laughs> something that actually parents. people saw. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but you know what? I wasn't complaining at the time. I, uh, you know, no, no, as long as the checks didn't bounce, I was perfectly fine. That's that. right. That's right. We had a really good time. So, so you obviously, we, we finished that show many years ago, and you obviously met Bob around that yes. time. Yep, yep. And, and and for those of you who might, you know, obviously listening, uh, Bob Goen, veteran uh, uh, TV host, best known for Entertainment Tonight. You guys got married, and, and how did the radio show come about? Just kind of one of those fluky things. We were both underemployed at the time and fishing around for something to do. And um, our agents told us about this. We had both hosted uh, TV shows at Game Show Network Radio. Okay. I'm sorry, at Game Show Network Television. And they were starting this new thing on the radio. It was, it was going to be game shows on the radio, and they were looking for a co-host team. And um, Bob and I were called in to go, and we were auditioning together. And again, both of us just basically are the, we're the same people at the audition that you you would meet at my house for a dinner party right and we just went with it and it was i gotta tell you it was a hilarious audition we had the whole room just cracking up and we and you'll know this as, as someone who's auditioned forever something you never get used to but we didn't have uh an outcome design for ourselves on this. It was like, what is this project Mm -hmm. radio on, on game show network? What are they doing? So, eh, let's just go do it. You know? So we, we didn't have an end game in mind. It was not something we expected to get. It's not something we were sure we even wanted to do, but we decided let's do the audition. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, we got the gig. And, um, it was a lot of fun. Actually, I got to tell you, it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and then from there, there were two producers helping out to get the show launched, et cetera, two really veteran radio producers from L.A. And they would pop into the studio every now and then and say, you know what? You guys really need 
a radio show, meaning a, a regular on the, on the big call terrestrial versus satellite. You know, mm-hmm. uh, this was an online thing for game show network people. So anyway, we put a tape together and Cumulus called and we moved to Cincinnati. <laughs> right. Could you, yeah. how, how could you have ever predicted Cincinnati? Never. I've never. I've never even and never even been here before. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, so it kind of happened slowly and then all at once. You know, can you right. start tomorrow? That kind of a thing. Wow. And we decided, you know what? L.A. is not presenting enough um, opportunities for us. This is let's jump off the cliff. And six years later, here we are. So, yeah. 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 And I mean, that's, 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 a, that's a great run. It is for radio. It's actually pretty good. They say you know you really aren't in radio until you've been fired at least twice. <laughs> <laughs> so what, well, is one it? down. One down. <laughs> <laughs> Check that box. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's that's funny. So okay. So speaking of checking that box and boxes, I I read your blog, ah. uh, your latest your your latest blog entry, which was classic uh, Marianne Coran, and you Snark. can. You can find it at mariannecoran.blogspot.com, and That's it's me. the uh, "Are you gonna need a box?" blog post, and it's it's funny because I you know I I, started, I was reading it and I was like, "Where is she going with this?" And then of course I was like, "Oh, duh, right." It's every time or anytime someone's in a office situation, you get called into HR and they say, "Well, you know, we're going in a different direction," and you're you know fired. Are you gonna need a box? <laughs> are yeah. You, yeah. Are you, are you to take your shit out? Right. <laughs> <laughs> And I, you know, it dawned on me, we were literally in the car on the way home from that meeting, and we just went into this whole series of gallows humor commentary. Right. And we were just, you know, making each other crack up because it was so surreal. You yeah. were working that morning, and then you're not that afternoon, which is how they do it in radio. Right. And, um, and I was in this interview with HR and the boss, and behind HR, there were two empty cardboard boxes. And I almost did one of those <laughs> in the middle of the meeting, as unpleasant as the whole thing was. Right. Like, I almost wanted to elbow Bob, but we were also we were in this Look at the boxes. office. Someone's yeah, getting fired. We elbow to elbow. And sure enough, once the meeting was over and we gathered our, you know, exit paperwork, yes, uh, she asked us, are you going to need a box? <laughs> so we talked about it in the car on the way home. I said, oh, my God, that's my new blog. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and sure enough, the big guy says, well, we just decided we're going in a different direction. You know, yeah. but everybody says that. Yeah. So Can I go in do? that direction, too? I mean, I wasn't actually asked if I could go in the direction you're going in. Yeah. I, yeah. I, did you did you make me an offer I couldn't refuse? Yeah. No. I can adjust. No, no, just going on, going at your own. Okay. (laughs) But that's what it dawned on me. You know, I've, I've not gotten jobs. Our show got canceled eventually. You know, I have had pilots that didn't get picked up, uh, et cetera, but I have never been in a meeting where they have said, we're going in a different direction. And are you going to need a box? And that's the first time I realized I've been, I've officially been fired the way the rest of the world has. That's right. That that's right. Cause you and I have never been handed a box because we don't work in corporate America in a cubicle where we have bobbleheads. So we, you know, I mean, our show, honestly, as far as I recall, it was just kind of like, we're not coming back this year. I mean, I think yeah, my agent let done. me know it was, you don't even show up. You just get a call no. from your agent saying, no mas, Tomas. It's done. Yep. Did you ever, did I ever tell you the story of how I actually found out I got before and afternoon? The no, show? I don't think so. Uh-uh. Um, so obviously, you know, we, we went and we auditioned and then we had a callback. You and I were in the room together. We did right. our thing. And then now I was, I want to say broke, but I was not doing well financially at the time. <laughs> And right. I was I was doing whatever I could to make ends meet. Let's just say I needed a breakthrough, right? I needed right. I needed something substantial to occur. And I'd kind of put all my eggs in one basket. I kind of I'd done the all right, Jordan, what are you doing here? You've been here seven years. It's kind of like the the seventh inning stretch. It's time to all right, are you leaving or are you staying for the rest of the game? And I chose to stay. I was catering and I ended up having to audition for this new job. Audition, not for an acting job, for a job. Being, oh, wow. being, I had to, I had to submit a headshot, and I've I've told this story on another episode, but oh either way around God. it, I had to submit a headshot to be considered to be a quote character kids love, end quote. Oh, oh, yeah, 
And so if you can imagine what a character kids love is, it's basically what you could probably imagine. If you want Superman or Spider-Man or James Bond or Elmo to show up at your kid's birthday party. Oh, God. All character kids love. So oh God. <laughs> I was invited. I was it's invited like to, to audition for two days and to train to be considered not hired to be considered. And so this is happening at the same time that I get the call on a Monday from my agent saying, you book the job right now. Oh, wow. When someone says you book the job now, I had never had a series at that point. I'd never, right. I didn't know what negotiating a contract meant. Right. So I basically got the call from my agent saying you booked the job. I'm like, woohoo. I was like, let's go. He's like, shh, sit down. Sit down. <laughs> and he basically talked me off the, the ceiling and then right. explained to me, you know, this is how much they're offering. This is how much how this, he played it out like five years out. This is how much I was like, those sons of bitches. And I, you know, they've lowballed me. And I'm like, it kind of awoke to the fact that, oh, right. I had no idea what I was doing. So thank God I had a good agent and he basically walked me through it. We passed on the offer, which is what you do. And and then they came back with more money. <gasps> they must really oh, like me. And yeah. then I passed again. And then, the, you know, it was kind of like that game, right? Right. And again, that's just what you do, but I had never done it. So Yeah, and it's it's frightening to to put yourself in those hands and to, you know, terrible. Terrible. To, to take the shot that they're going to go, F you, kid. Right. You've got nothing going on. Take it or leave it. Yeah, you know? well, exa exactly. That happens a lot more now than it did then. Right. Like next, we got someone else in the in the wings who's oh, ready yeah. to take this job. And yeah. so we passed a couple times. And then I remember I had gone in for a night of training at the Character Kids Love offices. And then <laughs> Sorry. the second, no, no, it's good. It's really good stuff. So the second day, I mean, we're look, we're talking like balloon animals and stories and using the parachute uh, tent thing uh, and, you know, all this really, you know, we, we needed to be trained. It was a, it was a high skills environment. And so we, um, this is like a, it was a Tuesday night. I had to go in for my second thing. We've gone back and forth, pass, 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 more money, more money, more money. Right. I'm like, this is, this is kind of fun, but it's scary at the same time. And I'm keep on saying to my agent, just please don't burn this. I'm trusting you. Please don't burn this. You, you know, you know this better than I do. Push it till you can push it, but you know, back off when you need to back off. Cause right. I don't, I don't want to lose this job. Yeah, exactly. And so I remember pulling into the parking lot to, go in for my evening of training. And I remember <laughs> talking to my agent and saying, listen, this is the offer. This is the last number. And I didn't say to tell him to tell them this, but it was kind of like a take, take it or leave it. This is it. This is, this is, a, I was kind of like, let's push it one more time. You know what I mean? And I remember he said, okay, got it. Closed the door, went in, hung up my phone, sat down, did my training. And I'm sitting there that evening this is like a Tuesday night. I'm sitting there and we're sitting in a circle telling stories and my phone rings. Mind you, I am wearing a Winnie the Pooh head at the time. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wearing a Winnie the Pooh head <laughs> telling a story with a, with a circle full of other out of work struggling actors, right? Oh. Phone rings. I stand up, remove the Winnie the Pooh head and, <laughs> and kindly and politely excuse myself from the circle past the Winnie the Pooh head on. And I made my way out the door just to, you know, get away from the, you know, where they were meeting and not to be distracting. So I step outside and it's my agent and manager. Now, I don't know if you've had an agent manager at the same time, yeah. but yeah. when they're both on the phone, it's usually a good thing. Mm -hmm. And all I remember them saying was they took the deal and it took everything in me not to like whistle zippity doo dah and like skip up and jump in the air and right. like, make a complete <laughs> ass of myself through right. the window. You know what I mean? Oh, <laughs> yeah. And I had to calm myself, collect myself. They basically, you know, they, they picked us up for like 12 episodes. It was a really nice chunk of change for the amount of work we were going to do. I was like, this is amazing. And I went back in calmly, sat back down in the circle and completed the training. And then what a good man. And then left. And they literally were like on the way, like, so, so, oh, George, 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 would you mind? Um, are you into, are you available this weekend by any chance? And I was like, God, I don't want to be a dick, but um, kind of just booked a job. <laughs> They're like, oh my God, that's amazing. They were really awesome. You know, I was like, I don't want to burn my bridges. You know what hey, I mean? It's like anybody who, who does that for a living 
has to know right. that they're going to lose actors on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. either way around it, it was a it was an extraordinary experience and one of those moments, you know, of like, oh mm-hmm. my god, thank god it went my way. Thank God it went my way. Yeah, so we all would... have th- those stories. I think it went one of my phases of unemployment. And, you know, I do impersonations. And Martha Stewart was my big kahuna. And I went to some talent thing where they were hiring impersonators. And I was sitting in this room with people. And this is not to be stuck up about it. But, you know, I did. The, this was before The Tonight Show. Right. Um I really do a good Martha Stewart and I'm a trained comedian and impressionist. And I am in a room with lookalikes. There is a big difference between people who are impressionist and somebody who puts on an Elvis costume right. and goes, hubba, hubba, you know, right. so I was surrounded by people who are Looked not like professional. Her. They are, and they're barely lookalikes. And I filled out all the paperwork and I was signed up for the next phase. And I went up to the woman who was running it and she was not happy, but I was like, I'm sorry, this is not for me. And I left. There was no way, you know, I was like, I'm not even going to go through the motions on this. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. That, the Winnie the Pooh head's pretty good. How, how long did you do Hillary? Oh, my God. I was doing Hillary back in Washington when they were in office. Um, oh, right. A, That's right. Yeah, we did a few. My comedy group at the time called Gross National Product, which I did with my ex-husband. <laughs> my now ex-husband. Um, yeah, a little choking on that one. Sorry. We did. We we were doing a show called Clintoons, and it was making fun of the Clinton administration. Before that, it was George Bush, an administration on thin ice. No, it was called Bush Capades, an administration on thin ice. You know, we had all these funny shit. So it was in Washington. So we did a little, a uh, lot of topical political stuff. Right. And I played Hillary and we even did some PBS specials back in those days. And yeah, so I started impersonating her when they, they ended up in Washington and then through the years. And, and then when she started running for office, I really, um, you know, perfected it. And I was working with a guy, I don't know if you remember a guy playing George playing W basically on the tonight show. Oh, right. And, he was really yeah. good. He was phenomenal. Yeah, I remember him. I, used, I used to run into him at the Tonight Show because he'd be on there playing Bush and I'd be on there playing Martha. And I got to befriend his manager and they were like a team. And when Hillary was putting her hat in the ring, I called up this guy, Randy, and I said, Randy, you know, you know me as Martha on the Tonight Show, but I've been impersonating Hillary forever. You know, do you want to talk about doing you know, a Hillary thing since she's running. So I met with him. We, we put it together. It was, uh, Steve Bridges is the actor. He passed away very tragically, very young. Yeah. In his sleep. And so he would still be working, but he was on the tonight show for eight years playing George Bush and George Bush loved him. He thought he was a hoot. As a matter of fact, Steve was on the the white at the white house correspondence dinner and they, they did dueling George Bushes. Wow. Uh, was hilarious. So anyway, long story longer is is uh, I hit up his manager, Randy. We had lunch. She said, okay, well, let's try it out. And we did a test run with the makeup. Oh, my God. Sitting in a chair getting prosthetics done for three hours is grueling. Right. <laughs> it's fascinating, but it's grueling. Yeah. And even though I had been doing Martha for years on The Tonight Show, Jay wanted to see, you know, how my Hillary was before he put me on the air. Right. So I went into his office done up as Hillary in full prosthetics and, you know, did and it was a room full of all his writers, several of whom I'd gotten to be friendly with from the Martha days. So it was a friendly room, but it was still intimidating. There's, you know, Jay Leno sitting at his desk. Yeah. And a sea of people waiting for me to prove myself. Yeah. So I did a couple of my standard. When, when you, when you, before you walked in there, were you feeling pretty darn com- confident though about what you were bringing? No, no matter how think so. intimidating it is, but you kind of walk in like, Either you're yeah. not prepared and you're feeling really rocky or you're feeling like, you know what, I, I bring something here and I'm going to be nervous. <laughs> well, yeah, all, all of the above. And, you know, I got uh, it was torture for me to watch Anna Gasteyer pretend to do Martha Stewart on the Saturday Night Live. And then Amy Poehler comes along and does Hillary. And I heard she didn't even want to try to do that. She's not an impersonator. Right. And it right. was so lame. And I look up at the television and there's the real Hillary with Amy Poehler. And I'm like, that should be me. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it's really hard to see people, you know, at that, you know, on SNL doing things that you do so much better. So my confidence level in the impersonation, which at this point is now I've been working on it for 20 years. Right. Basically. Right. And 
I studied the bejesus out of her mannerisms and and, and didn't make it a cartoon. Did you bring uh, her back? So. Did you bring her back when she was running again? No, we did not do it this time. Um, I'm just wondering. And, I'm just wondering what it was. What it was like, if at all, did you ever get any like crackpot giving you shit when you were doing it? Oh yeah, no, no. It was there was some weird shit. But anyway, just to finish the Lena <laughs> thing. So I did oh, sorry, a couple right. jokes. They all laugh. They love it. He goes, "Hey, Marianne, that's great. That's great. Good, good stuff. Good stuff." And then one of his head writers said, "How about the laugh?" And I let out my <laughs> cackle, and the room fell apart. So um, I got to do Hillary, which was a, as they say in New York, my favorite term when something's really great. It was a pissa. Yeah. Um, no, no. When I was doing uh, the sketch comedy back in D.C., we did a lot of corporate gigs. And um, every now and then, uh, me, uh, myself playing Hillary and our, my friend playing Bill would get invited to do, uh, you know, walk arounds and meet and greets or maybe a, a 15 minute, you know, thing on stage. Mm -hmm. But we got hired one time for a, what they call a walk around where you just mix and mingle with people and, you know, make jokes and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it was turns out it was a Republican event Oof. and they had hired us. So that they could individually like mess with us while we were out. And I'm like, I'm not the real Hillary folks. I'm playing a part. Right. And they were so vicious about the Clintons. As a matter of fact, one guy really ticked me off because he had kids there and they were like nine, 10, something like that. Two kids. And he said, Hey, let me introduce you to the, you know, the bitch of the century or oh. something like that. And I was like, sir, there, I didn't say it cause I was in character, but it's like, really? You're you're poisoning your children to have yeah. that opinion when they have no idea what you're talking about. Well, that's so how that it's was done. A little awkward. Yeah, hatred is bred. It's not. Yeah. Natural. It's taught. Yeah, so anyway, so yeah, we had a couple of those. The one gig I was glad I was not on, and this was in the day of uh, George H. W. Bush. I actually impersonate older George. Um, <laughs> bar gonna bars in heaven now. Gonna miss her. Um, <laughs> but so it was the era of the, of the first Bush family. And I had a, a, a gig that I couldn't go on the road with the troop. And we had one guy who played, I don't know if this is way before your time, but there was a talk show host who was crazy. His name was Morton Downey Jr. Oh yeah. No, I remember him. Yeah. Okay. And he was, he was kind of like, you know, the throwing chairs version of a talk show. Yeah. And one of my friends played him in the show. He decided to get loaded on the plane on the way to the gig. Oh boy. And so he shows up with a couple too many in him and my ex at the time did not do his homework very well and figure out that this was a fundraiser for Bush. His daughter was in the back of the room and they proceed to do a sketch that they no more should have done the man, the moon. And it is Morton Downey Jr. with Barbara Bush and Kitty Dukakis on stage. And he starts lighting into Barbara Bush and calling her insulting names, all comedy driven, but driven by his character, Morton Downey Jr. And in in a nightclub with drunk people where we normally perform, you can get people to go along with that. But when you're at a, a, a GOP fundraiser for her husband, you don't light in and have, try to get the audience to chant your insult. So the woman who had hired us, <laughs> I was so happy I was home came behind the sound booth and she started unplugging things. Oh boy. <laughs> she was like, when does this end? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It's misery. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so I'm not sure if I missed that part of the business or not. Yeah. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure. So I'm, I'm wondering, cause I mean, obviously that sounds like something that um, could be construed as a troop failure <laughs> as yeah. far as like a, you know, a, a breakdown, if you will, in the, uh, in the troop, what would you, how is a failure in your own life, let's say, so an, an apparent failure, something that has happened to you in the past? I'm a big believer, and I, you know, I think anybody who's successful would agree mm -hmm. that success comes with failure. And in fact, you almost kind of want to embrace the possibility of failure because well, it's, it, it's it, how it's, we it's learn. A it's a tremendous learning That's opportunity. That's right. Exactly. Hopefully, yeah. We, we run from failure so often that we, I think we're missing a doorway to success. So I'm wondering if there's anything in your past that you can recall where you're like, Oh man, I shit the bet on that one, but thank God. Or I learned so much from it as a result. Anything comes to your mind? Oh boy. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think 
I, I, I don't know. If, I hope this is relatable and maybe not because our business is so different from so many more structured businesses where things take a normal, you know, from A to B to C, which ours does not. I did two episodes of Live with Regis the week Kathy Lee was off, was gone. And it was one of the most exciting moments of my life because I was up for that job, which Kelly Ripa has now had for 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And God, is it that long? Man, I'm getting old. <laughs> but uh, I, at the time, was I was on a list of hosts to be interviewed and things like that when people had hosts, not experts. And um, but I was I had done a talk show or two. And, and so anyway, so I went into that show and had two of the best days on television I've had in my entire career. They were ecstatic, meaning the producers and Regis was all he he's not an effusive guy, apparently, but he called me and thanked me. And it was just I was high as a kite. It was just could not have been a better experience. Mm -hmm. And deeply, I kind of knew that I was, you know, I'm not a known person. You know, I had a great, great two episodes on the show. I knew the show back because I actually impersonate Kathy Lee. So mm -hmm. I had watched it quite a lot and I knew to let Regis be in charge. But I got my zingers in and the audience, it just, everything, it couldn't have gone better. Right. It was it was an A plus. All right. So I come back from that experience. My phone is ringing off the hook. My agent and managers are fielding calls and offers and things like that, which has never happened to me. Never. So you're getting offers for other projects while you're in the mix for a project. Yeah. Got I, I got an offer to start. Uh, I got an offer from Fox to do a pilot to host a pilot, which was when The View came out, uh, the networks decided they would try to do a male version of The View to counter The View. And but they knew that the daytime audiences really were primarily female. Mm -hmm. So I was hired to be the central host with four guys on a talk show. That was basically The View with guys and me leading the female energy of it. Right. And we shot this actually. So I got offered this pilot. I didn't want to take it. I've never been offered a pilot. Right. You know, but and I knew that it was a risk, but I didn't want to do it because the Regis thing went so well that I thought, you know what? Ultimately, if I get this job, it would be a miracle. But they're going to milk this thing because it's sort of like the search for Scarlett O'Hara right. that everybody knew about it. Everybody was tuned into the show to see who's going to be the net. That's how popular that's. Oh, yeah. Show, I remember. Right. Yeah. And. It's a ratings juggernaut that has nobody's been able to compete with that show just because of the time and the fact that they do host chat. The first six to eight minutes of that show is the show. The rest of it is a parade of people pitching projects. And I knew that if I could nail host chat, I'd be in good stead. Right. So I just thought for the first time in my life, Marianne, go for it. And that's what my gut told me. It's like they're going to have me back because – Gelman, the producer that you see on there all the time, and the other executive producer came into my dressing room after the show and said, do you have any conflicts? No, I don't yeah, have any conflicts. Good question. Yeah. They would have had me back a lot. And it would have cemented me being on national television and people seeing me regardless of whether I got the job. So that was the angle I was going for. But this Fox thing was, it's now or never. They're getting ready to shoot. They just, they're not happy with anybody they've auditioned and they want you. You don't have to try out. They want you. Mm. So my my manager and my agent were like, it's a burden hand. Take it, take it, take it. And I struggled with it for a couple days and I just caved to the pressure and did the pilot. We shot a great pilot. Everybody at the network. Now, when, you had to when, you, when you had to say yes to the pilot, did that mean you had to say your first position now? Place. Yeah, I had I it was a competition. Yeah. You had to forego. Had to, you had to forego I had to, Regis. Yeah, I had to take myself out of the running. Yes. Yep. yes. So uh that was when the pilot pilot we shot a great pilot. It it really went well. The network was crazy about it. We were doing publicity, we were getting ready to launch this thing, and then they got you know this drill. They had a new CEO come in. Yep. He, he had the competing show with the four male guys over at NBC. He comes mm. over to Fox and he goes, No, I'm not gonna do it. Ugh. So Everything went away. The Ugh. Regis thing went away. The Fox thing went away. And it Oof. was a big, it was, a, for me, that was, that was a big test of my gut. And I was like, Marianne, you always go with what the adult, you know, we're, with the manager and the agent. It's like, they must know better than me. They must, you right. know? And I didn't trust my instincts. And that, that will not happen again. I will trust my instincts. Yeah. I was listening to Jeff Daniels talking recently about something and I love Jeff Daniels and he was He's talking awesome. when he was 
in discussion about doing Dumb and Dumber. He was offered <laughs> Dumb and Dumber and, you know, opposite one of the premier comedians of our time. Oh, my God. And yeah. Jeff Daniels not is, known, you know, Jeff Daniels is not, not, known. not known for comedy. Exactly. And at that time at all. You know, as far as as far as we were concerned, and had he done terms of endearment by then? Maybe that yeah. was the only thing that really, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Right. And, and his agents all said, "Head for the hills. Don't you know? This is, we're we're, uh, we're taking you. We're taking you in another direction. We're not another direction, but we're taking you in this direction, which you know is Golden Globes and Oscars and Emmys and yeah. things like that. As a serious dramatic actor, that's not it. Beyond the fact that, do you really think you're going to be able to stand up, si- you know, side by side?" With Jim, with Jim Carrey. Carrey. Yeah. And he basically, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but you know, pretty much, you know, f- fuck, fuck you guys. I'm I'm doing this. And, I, yeah. you know, as far as my recollection of his interview, when I was listening to him talk about it, the, the, the nitty gritty of it was just what you said. It's he had to say, everyone's telling me don't do this, but I'm saying this is what I'm up to. This is where I'm going. This is what's right for me. And, you know, he crushed it. He was he complimented Carrie so beautifully, <laughs> you know, I mean, here we are talking at like it's, right. Citizen Kane. it's like it's Citizen Kane. It was dumb and dumber, but it was so funny. And he totally was, he was great. It didn't miss. And yeah. so anyway, yeah. I, I had a similar experience uh, last year happen where I was, uh, I, I had a, it wasn't quite the same in, in regards to what you're saying, where you had, you know, the Regis kind of thing and another pilot, you know, that's kind of a different level, but I was uh, up for a a commercial and, you know, a, a really good paying commercial, hadn't booked the job yet. And then literally as I was on hold, meaning they're like, we like you, but we're not going to book you yet. Kind of, you know, just for anybody who's not in the industry being on right. hold. They're like, but they just dangle the candy in front of you and they don't, and then they can still take it from you. Right. But, <laughs> but mm-hmm. either way around. Mm-hmm. So I'm on hold for the commercial. And while I'm on hold, and we're talking like within 24, 48 hours of this happening. I get a call from my agent, my other agent. So there's a theatrical agent and there's a commercial agent, two different offices. Theatrical agent says, hey, I just got a call. You have an offer for a film. And wow. yeah, 10 days out of town, uh, not too far, um, you know, from Los Angeles. It was Big Bear. So, you know, two hour drive. Right. Uh, but right. 10 days out of town. And of course, I'm thinking, oh, my God, yes. You know, I'm going to do this film because, I mean, I, at the end of the day, that's what I love being able to do would be to do a scripted character you know in a film and so that's essentially what i did and and then as i'm saying i'm going to take it because i said i don't want to mess up the the commercial because obviously that's really really good money but they hadn't booked me and then they booked me so they booked me on the commercial and the film and they were conflicting dates of course and i was like well look guys i don't want to be i mean here's the here's, here's the kicker the film was not going to pay as much as the commercial was. Right. But the film was going to give me what I wanted to creatively. It was going to give me something for my agents to share. It was going to be on TV. It actually aired on TV at the beginning mm-hmm. of this year, you know, for several uh, showings. It was a film. So it showed for several, you know, they kept on rotating it. And I knew that. So it was kind of an investment in something bigger than my bank account, you know. Right, right. But, but the idea of still passing up money, you know, I've got three kids. It's like, you know, I'm not living the Vita Loca entirely, right? So I literally had to say, I'm going for the film. Like, you know, I had to really just kind of step in and say, this is what I'm, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm committed to. Mm-hmm. I will get other commercials. You don't often, I don't necessarily <laughs> get, like you said, offered films right, very often right, right, you know, right. where you don't yeah. have to audition and go through the whole routine somebody is saying we want you are you available you know i mean you kind of want to go yeah so long story short uh or long story longer like you said is i took the film i said guys i'm taking the film it conflicts i know um here are the dates that i'm available here are the dates that i'm not available and i hung up the phone and they said we'll take care of it don't worry about it and they went and cleaned it up and that was that Two hours later, I get a phone call from the commercial agent saying they moved the production dates to accommodate your freedom, your, your, your dates of not, not being on the film. That's incredible. Yeah. So I was literally shooting like what's like the 15th to the 25th or something like that. And I was off on yeah. the 20th and the 21st. And they said, we'll move it from the 16th to the 20th and the 21st so that you can 
do the shoot, shoot the commercial too. That's impressive. That's it was great. It, it was extraordinary. It was one of those yeah. like, oh my goodness, thank you. Um, but again, it's like one of those things where you never know how it's going to play out, and you just kind of have to say, you know what, I'm um, I'm going to trust. I'm going to I'm going to have yeah. faith. And well, it's hard. It's so hard to do that in a business where you know you are so easily replaced, and if you are struggling at all financially. Uh, and you not you don't you're not somebody who can pick or choose your work. I have never been able to choose. I have had of like, well, here's the opportunity. I'm taking it. And you know that's a gift that very few people in in radio, television, any performing entity get to be in that club where you get to say no and you don't have to look behind you going, is that's the last job I was gonna get? I'm ever gonna get? And exactly. I'm saying no. You know so. I will never be in that position. It never have, and it's not going to happen now. So, you know, we'll see. Yeah, and we don't know. Leads. Yep. And we never know whether or not they are over the moon for us right. until, until you book the job. I mean, you can book the job and they can, you, you're on the job. And they're like, oh my God, we knew it was you from the very beginning. We're so glad you said yes. Like, oh, know. that happens all the time. I didn't know me. that. <laughs> so, I'm so glad, but you know, our egos are so fragile. Yeah. <laughs> what do you, what would you say is a, uh, an unusual habit or something absurd that you like? Oh boy. Uh, an absurd habit that or, I or, like. Or let's just say this. Is there something that Bob thinks? Cause you might not think it's absurd. You might think it's totally normal, but is there something that you do that Bob's like, babe, seriously? Uh, it's as simple as I have problems opening things like Trisket containers or, <laughs> Or um, opening Skype apps on your phone? That, if it's technical, <laughs> just count me out. I mean, I think you've known that from me. Bob and I, and Bo, what's terrible is that my husband and I are the same person in that regard. If you hear somebody swearing at the top of their lungs in this house, they're yeah. usually on their computer. Got it. Um, with no, yeah, with no IT available. Oh, helpless and helpless. Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing I'm going to miss from my job is calling Jason down the hall and going, I, Help. I can't get yeah, I could just blah, 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 blah. okay. And so, so, so the Trisket, the what about the Trisket and, thing? Okay, so I have a problem. Bob thinks that I'm part <laughs> bear because I have a problem opening packages, and it is a pretty odd thing that uh, you, there are these dog treats that are resealable, and I can't ever. And there's a little, it, there's a pair of scissors drawn on the thing, <laughs> shows you exactly where to cut tear, the brick. Tear thing open. here, dummy. Right here, dummy, <laughs> and. I did it right for the first time since I've been buying these treats for years for my dogs. And I cut through the thing that seals it. I rip it open and the whole bag busts. I do that with, with things all the time. I spill, well, the, the biggest habit of mine that's not even intentional is I must eat like a bear too. And, you know, and I, I've grown up with manners, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I have, when the dry cleaning comes back, inevitably if i have any dry cleaning in the return there's one of those tags on it mm. that says oops sorry we tried because <laughs> right. i spill food on myself <laughs> <laughs> couldn't remove the stain oh no learn how so to eat like a oh, human oh it's 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 embarrassing and bob goes he'll just see <laughs> we were having a conversation in the kitchen one day and i had already eaten breakfast earlier that morning and I'm making him some breakfast. We're standing across the island from each other. He goes, what is that on your neck? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so I'm like, what are you talking about? And I go to the bathroom. I look in the mirror and there's egg yolk dried on my neck. Uh, what is that on your neck? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I just, I don't do it on purpose. I don't. And literally I will have food on me that came from another person. It will find its wow. way on, and I love white t-shirts. I must have 40 of them right. because they, I have the ones that I can wear to work in the yard that have food stains and the other ones. Right. Your public so, t public t-shirts and private t-shirts. Yeah. And Bob will shake his head. Thank God he loves me because he'll look and he'll go, you know, it really is quite remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's weird. Cause my, my, it's, it's so great. It's one of those things though, that I'm sure that is such a, an area of affection for him. Also, I got to believe oh, he thinks it's hilarious. He thinks, he it's, thinks and, it's, and that like only yeah. probably makes him love you more. 
And it's yeah. it's those little idiosyncrasies that make you you. And right. that's what he fell in love with. Is and I am so proud of the fact that spilling food on my son. Yes. Well, I mean, thank God someone. Thank God someone loves it, right? <laughs> um, my my wife, my wife, who you know. So yes. we we have like three pillows each, right, in bed. Yes. Okay. Yes. And there's like two really long ones, and then a, a shorter one. Okay. And we each have three. Okay. Now I tend to I tend to bogart the pillows. And Uh I'll sometimes steal hers or whatever. And so we're watching TV or whatever. It's time to go to bed. And she will inevitably say, whose pillow is that? The one that I'm, the one that I'm laying on. Now that's, that's if I just actually have only three of them. I haven't stolen an extra one. It's just the three. But for some reason, the small pillow that we have and that she has, they look identical. They're they're identical looking. Of course. So I grab them and I'm a little bit more, I'm a little bit a little more rough with my pillows. You know, I kind of bunch them up, fold them up. You know, I don't really care. Right, she doesn't right. like that. That makes her upset. I still do it. Either way around it, she will literally pretty much every night have to inspect the pillow that I have as being hers or not hers. And I she, suggest monogram pillowcases. I, no, seriously. I'm literally like, honey, I'm going to literally put an indelible marker. Just, I'm just going to I'm just going to put a line down your pillow and it's the pillow itself though and she will literally pick it up and squeeze it and see oh oh is this oh the firmness the squishing uh, mm, yeah no and then, then the other one showed, uh, same thing I'm like you're you're mental and it's <laughs> it is a routine that she goes yeah, through no it's, it's and she uh, knows that she's crazy and I'm yep. and I just kind of lay there and enjoy it Cause... Bob is so normal. Bob is, is he's one of the funniest human beings I know. He's sharp as a tack with his wit, but he's a very straight laced yeah. kind of boxed in guy. Yeah. So I am completely the opposite. I don't have a rational bone in my body considering that I was so he, he he's astounded by the fact that I was a straight A student in school. He's like, but nothing you do makes sense like you i'm like captain obvious you know like right right wow you know you would think that i was like a dumb blonde well i'm not really a blonde so maybe that's why but (laughs) (laughs) but it is i astound myself i'm like i'm a generally bright person um but some of this shit that comes out of my mouth and on the radio show would happen all the time Right. And Bob and our producer, they would just like stop with their jaw open. Like, did you just say that? Yep. And it was gold for radio. But yeah. but yeah, I astound myself sometimes at how idiotic I sound. In, in, anyway. well, no, see, this, is, this is really great, though. I mean, it's like that kind of quality in a person could be construed as like weak or like a, a, some. Oh, I'm ashamed of that quality in me. Oh, no, I but, own it. Yes, I own it. <laughs> totally. And, and, and we and we can, you know, what I mean, we can actually say, sure. yeah, you know what? I have faults. I make mistakes. I'm not perfect. I'm human. And there's something very attractive. I mean, you, you, you know, anybody who does what we do, especially if you've got an ego, which most of us who do what we you do, have do to. <laughs> um, you know, we're literally always kind of putting something on and and being presentational. It's very easy to have people from the outside looking in to take a jab at like, what does this guy know? And sure. oh, he, he thinks he's all that. You got to be self-deprecating. You've got to take the piss oh, out that, of yourself. That's, that's always been my that's my entire that's really the core of my humor. And if you read my blogs there, it's there's a combination of self deprecation, snark, and then hopefully some heart that makes it real. And, uh, yeah. And and I know I use self deprecation as, you know, a a suit of armor. So that's why in my writing, it's really important for me to have a peek into the heart behind the snark. You know, that this is coming from either a painful thing or something that I can't just talk to you about straight and that's not going to enter. You know, I want it to be entertaining, obviously. So. So, So, yeah, no, no, it's a it's it's something that I've realized in in being a host, especially in addition to just being a person in life, that it has been my strong suit. Yeah, is that it makes me real. And it's, I'm not trying to make it real. It is who I am. I still <gasps> shit on my shirt yeah. all the and, time. And be, I, I think it's being honest, being honest about it. And I think that, I mean, for example, I was going to you know, just ask you as far as fears that we, you have. I mean, we all, obviously, 
at the core of everything we do or don't do are driven by fear. Oftentimes oh, it's either pain, pain or pleasure, you know, something we're something we're deeply afraid of or something we're consistently confronted by sure. that we're afraid of. What would you what would you say is one of your doozies? Oh, uh, for me, it's always been uh, approval. You know, I'm mm-hmm. a daddy's girl and I was the straight A student who had all the makings of huge success and whatever she chose to do. And I was encouraged to do whatever I wanted to do. Nobody was, you know. My father was the biggest influence of my life, and I did everything to get his approval, and I carried that into, and I got it. I mean, I was was a good kid, but I never really operated on my own decisions. It was always looking to, like, is is this going to be good? Is this going to be, is this the way I, you know, am I going to get a pat on the head? Am I going to get a bear hug, you know? And he wasn't judgmental, but he had big expectations for me. And that's a real, that's the center of my being is approval. And when somebody, when I disappoint people, that is the hardest thing in the world for me because I'm so centered in, if you don't approve of me, that means you don't like me and I wasn't a good girl. And, you know, it's really, um, I I had a solo show called Little Miss Behaving Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. about the fact that I was a good little Catholic girl who did everything right. And I had a good, it was good Marianne and bad Marianne and bad Marianne was having all the fun. <laughs> and that's basically been my MO and it's a hard thing for me to shake. It's, in, it's ingrained. Yeah. And, and I think that that's, I guess, part of my next question is we all have those demons that sure. sometimes, that sometimes come to play. And I think that the question really is, how do you how do you manage that? Cause there's, there's, there's only so much we have control over, right? I mean, we have control over what uh-huh. we think and we have control over what we do. And when those thoughts show up, right? Cause they're just thoughts. Something happens. You're in a conversation with somebody or you're in an experience of something, you make an action and suddenly right. something does something. And then you automatically oftentimes, and I mean you, we, we all yeah, will sure. have this autopilot literally mm-hmm. start a script of I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable, whatever it is in the background mm-hmm. that's playing, mm-hmm. and then we right. act out of that fear to like protect and to survive and to fix and the whole nine yards. So that's what we, I mean, like, I'm saying this because this has been my own experience of doing this, right? Sure. That's, what, that's what we do. So what do you do now? Because you and I have been around, the, you know, we've been around the block a few times now. Sure. What, how, has it become easier? Do you have something that you do to navigate it when it shows up are you super present to it no 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 and no it's, 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 <laughs> not, uh, a, not a clue no it's 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 my thing and it is it is uh i've worked on it in therapy it has been part of you know bob and i got married in 2004 so we've been married for 14 years we've been together 17 and we're not fighters you know but we we've had some run-ins we we uh, when we really have issues we go to couples therapy and I recommend that to anyone. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, uh, we, we did therapy before we even got married just to make sure we were okay. And, but if I do something that he has a problem with, I become a 14 year old girl and he's my father. It's just, mm. it, I can't not go there. I go silent when I am worried that I've disappointed somebody. I go inward. I don't talk. It's terrible. It's the hardest thing to manage in my life. Uh, I will go days with just tiptoeing around uh. the issue and, and uh, bury it deep, deep, deeply within. Uh. And no, I, I, you know, I'm in, I'm in my fifties. I'm an old lady and, um, I should, you know, uh, we get through it, but I, it, it tears me apart. It tears me apart. I had a very difficult issue my siblings and I, well, my brothers and I get along great. My sister and I, not so much, but it was very odd. My, my brother, Michael's the oldest. And ever since my dad died in 2004, he sort of, you know, become the patriarch of the family. And, and, uh, I adore him. I adore both my brothers. And there was an issue that doesn't matter what it is, but Michael was blaming me for some riff with a sister-in-law. And he was under a lot of pressure from a lot of different reasons, but he is my big brother and he represents, you know, that authoritarian voice. To, you know, I've never mm-hmm. felt that way about a relationship, but this conversation led to that feeling. Mm-hmm. And he, for the first time since I've known him, he went at me like screaming at me. Mm. 
and I only bring this up is that I was a wreck for weeks over that, yeah. a wreck. And I knew that he was under undue pressures of a lot of family stuff going on with health issues and things and blah, 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 not worth explaining because they don't matter mm -hmm. to the point that my beloved brother was telling me that I effed up and, you know, and it's done. You remember daddy always said, what's done is done. You can't undo it. And, blah, 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 blah. and he screamed at me. And this is the day after I got fired. Oh, <laughs> so, oh man. So you were u yeah. uber vulnerable. Yeah. But that, that shit, I, I'm a wallower, you know, it, it goes deep and I've never learned how to shake it off. You know, it's just my thing. Yeah. And I no, hate it. I, I hate it. <laughs> well, so how long, how long is it? So, okay. How, let me ask you this then. All right. So, uh, so you parents were together, married, Till Forever. they passed. Okay, great. Yeah, they're um, both in 2004 and five. I lost them. Yeah, gotcha. And then you have four four siblings. You and three. You and, th you and three siblings. Two brothers. Yeah. Right. When this trigger occurs, are you are you aware of it? Completely. So you you're aware that you're literally it's, drowning it, and you visceral. can't it, not it's drown. It's visceral. Yeah, it's visceral. I I done it since you know i remember just going into my you know uh pepto-bismol pink bedroom in Bowie, maryland you know as a mm -hmm, kid mm -hmm. and and just it was it consumed me i i if anybody felt that i had done something that was wrong or wasn't a good girl choice and i was a good kid it wasn't like i was you know, right. some racy crazy and kid you, you had a good relationship you had a great relationship with your dad oh he was my guy right yeah right yeah so, I mean, I'm just, I'm kind of wondering, because most of these things, I mean, it's funny because I'm actually kind of identifying something that happened, you know, with my relationship with my mom and obviously with my wife, because they all play out, right? So whatever sure. is your, whatever you're playing out now, you've been playing it out for a long time. And so it's one of those questions of saying, okay, what was it in your past that happened that had you say what you're saying that's taking you apart, that's breaking you down, that's saying you're not good enough, you're not lovable, or whatever that disempowering conversation is that you're entertaining, but you're actually believing, right? Right. Because it's not, it's not true. I mean, are you aware of the fact that when you're in that, that dark space that what you're doing to yourself is really coming from a place self -destructive. of... Self-destructive? <laughs> self like, 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 there's no actual truth in what you're wallowing over? Well, there, there is, there's always a kernel of truth to it because it's something that either I made a bad choice, uh, that wasn't meant to be a bad choice. Okay, it wasn't got meant it. to be hurtful. Yes. Uh, but it results in somebody being disappointed. That's yep. the key word is right. that uh, there was an incident in my life that I'm not going to divulge to you, but it was a pivotal point in got my it. life where something happened and I made a bad choice. Got it. And my father simply said to me, I thought you were smarter than that. Got it. Boom. And I, I, I can relive that moment. I'll be a hundred and I will be in that space with my father and hear those words. And that's all he said. And that and cut to the core. That's visceral for me because I'm, you know, I was mm. a smart kid. I was the good kid. My sister chased boys. I didn't, you know, I was, you know, a devoted student. I was ambitious. I was you know, I was independent and I decided I was going to do something. I did it and I did it well. And, you know, well, uh, right. Cause you, you so. were going to, you were going to be the good girl come hell or high water. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, but I'm human and yeah. Uh, you, so it was, you know, my dad adored me. I was a daddy's girl. I was the right. baby of the family. Well, that's my point, though. God forbid you disappoint dad. Oh, forget it. Right. And yeah. you did. And that's what, you know, you yeah. disappointed dad at a young age and he let you know it. Whether he was doing it consciously to really hurt you or not, it hurt you. And now it seems that what you're saying is when that little that little trigger gets triggered, you're right back there. Oh, it takes it takes it doesn't even take a, <laughs> it takes a minor thing. I'm, right. I'm a very despite the fact that I am a snarky self-deprecating cynic i have a high dose of cynicism in a lot of what i right, do right but when it comes down to it i don't want to disappoint the people i love yeah 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 no, yeah. i i, I yeah. No, and no, it's, nobody it's does just, it's not going to go anywhere i've worked on it you know for years and yeah it's in, in therapy in the room it feels like something i can handle but yeah that's my stickler that's my no I, I hear you i i recently was having a conversation with 
uh, my wife conversation. Was it a conversation or was it an argument? Well, it's kind of, <laughs> it was, it was, it was a, it was Fine a, line. it was a misunderstanding. I'm trying to think of how to, how to categorize it. But what was really interesting was, oh, I know what it was. All right. So we were having a conversation. Now my, my wife is, as you know, one of the sweetest people, oh, like the kind of person well. who everybody gets along with. And that's, Class and, act, that and lady. she's the kind of person who talk about, you know, being a people pleaser, you know, she is an award winning people pleaser and it, and talk, it and it's a, and it's a winning formula. She's, she, it, it works for her. And she's also aware of the fact that that's what she does. And so she's had to work on that also. Cause sometimes you kind of get, become like a, uh, a doormat, <laughs> you know, but yeah, either yeah. way around it, she's super sweet, you know, easy to get along with quick to laugh the whole nine yards. Doesn't hold a grudge. So, However, hey, she's put up with you for that. How long? She really has. She really has. <laughs> but she is. Uh, she she's a delegator. She likes to control the situation. Like, why don't we do this? Why don't you do that? You can you do that? That kind of thing, right? And I'll I'll play along. I'll you know. But I'm I'm usually the one who does things. I'll do it. I'll take care of it. That's my game, right? Gotcha. I, I'll take care of it. I'll do it on my own, kind of guy. That way I don't have to rely on anybody else to do it because I'll do it probably better. Okay. <laughs> I'll probably do it and I'll probably do it faster. And you get it done. I'll get it done. Yeah. And I can You're rely on that. So, yeah. so I know that about myself and, and she knows that about myself too. And either way around it, we were having this conversation about the fact that I – what was we were doing? I – she she works at you know a nine to five regular job and I'm doing the acting job which as you know it's a very different schedule right sure and so when it comes to her wanting to have free time social time things like that she'll say hey I'm going to do something after work I'm going to st- not come home until eight o'clock or I'm going out Friday night I'm going to go out with the girls and I'm always like yes go ahead go do it no problem even though that leaves me manning the fort. Right. Yep. Which I mean, I have three kids. It's a full time job, and of course. <laughs> and not, and my wife does a full time job as well. At you know, she does a nine to five. You know, five days a week, the whole nine yards, and she's also a mom. However, we were talking about you know, oh, I was going to do something that I was asking. You know, hey, you know what? Just taking into consideration our schedule, I'm going to go out of town for a, a a reunion up in San Francisco. And I, I made the plans to do it. And we hadn't discussed. She knew. She's like, oh, you're going to go up on Saturday. You're going to come, come back on Monday. It was kind of vague. Long story short, again, is basically what what irked me was when she asked me, it, had I taken her into consideration in my plans to go out of town? Ah. And I was like, of course I took you into consideration. But I made the plans anyway. <laughs> I was like... <laughs> I, I thought, I mean, but, but what happened was what I realized as we were having this argument, because I was feeling very right and I wanted to be right. And I wanted her to know that I was right and admit it that what I, and we, it was kind of like this weird thing where I kind of started to realize what I was doing while I was doing it. Right. And I said, you know what? I just don't want to be questioned. I don't want to have to answer for when I'm going to be back, <laughs> you know? But yeah, you that, want that slice of your old life back. That's right. But and, you know what? Yeah. But, but, that's, but that's what we do in relationships. We, we, you know, it's a partnership. And so either way around it, what I realized, though, what was really trippy, kind of getting back to the maternal-paternal game that we all sure. have in our lives, is that my mom was, a, a, you know, a very, I want to say domineering, but she was a very strong personality. She, okay. she ran the ship. She was home. She was delegating. She said, you do this, you do that. She had high standards, you know, that kind of thing. So I think whenever my wife seems to even whiff that personality, whiff that kind of action, mm-hmm. I go in, I go into fuck you, <laughs> Pretty much, you know, I'm like, you know what? <laughs> it, 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 it's subconscious. Be, that, and I really, and I, the crux of so many dual working couples yeah. you know three kids at those ages my god and you got twins i mean yeah craziness it's you know crazy. it's crazy uh, and they're it, you're, you're bound to like have those moments more than you ever with you and somebody said oh you know you're gonna be married you have three kids and blah 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 um oh man you would go oh we'll work it out no 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 we'll no i, I, I would love days where it's a little difficult but no it's just that's, that's tough shit i, I would mean, love <laughs> to and I, i've never done it but i i think it would be fun to write down <clears throat> like mm-hmm. a, a document of yeah. all of the things that one does as a parent. 
Oh. To be a parent. And then <laughs> when I have friends who are about to get married or have kids, I, right. first of all, I do this sometimes anyway. I'll invite friends who are single over, you know, who are dating somebody and I invite them over to like hang out and then they get to be with my kids for like a weekend or so. <laughs> this is, this is birth control. That's what I call oh, birth, yeah. it's birth oh, control. Totally. Totally. It's like, do you really want to do this? And oh, yeah. if I handed somebody a document that illustrated in black and white what the responsibilities are, known, unknown, expected, unexpected, of a parent on all levels, sign oh, right gosh. here. Sign right here. How old are they now? The girls are 10. Oh, and, my um, and my And Dash is uh, 13. He'll be 14, actually, the next month. Yeah. Oh, my so, God. So, yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody I, I joke with my wife all the time about it. I'm like, Who, whose idea was this? Oh, whose no, my, my dad idea? told both my brothers when they got married, if you're going to have kids, have them young. Yeah. <laughs> she won't survive it otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's crazy. <laughs> and, now, you know, now I've got a third, you know, I have a teenage son, which is, mm-hmm. you know, its own ball of wax because they're just they're just basically big mirrors of us they're just mirrors of us and it's like what i love about me and what i am annoyed by about me <laughs> oh like, yeah yeah welcome to it yeah mine's now 23 my stepson's 23 and yeah. he's this fabulous human being and i said to bob do you realize that at some point you were ready to like pin him up against the wall oh yeah 15 or 16 that's right <laughs> yeah leave him on the side of the road good oh, luck my God. Yeah, no, it's incredible. It's incredible. Yep. But we do it. We do it. I mean, and I, I say this <laughs> to people whenever I talk about being a parent. I mean, it's like it's one of the most extraordinary, beautiful, stupid ideas. I mean, it's it's like, <laughs> it's, it's so it's, it's like takes your breath away. And yet it's so psychotic at times because it doesn't seem to make rational sense. I and, highly recommend your girls are ten. I yeah. highly recommend you go see the movie Eighth Grade. Have you heard oh, about this movie? You know what? Yeah, my uh Dylan actually saw it and um I have not seen it yet, but yes, she said it was great. It's fantastic. And yeah. a cup Bob and I just busted a gut because there's there's so many things that are relatable, whether you have a girl or a boy. And the guy who did this film, they I read about it. he had a specific reason why he chose to profile an eight eighth grade girl. And, you know, she's she's awkward and she's chubby and you know she doesn't look like the the other girls that were perfect you know but she's trying to fit in and then she has these outbursts against her father who he's innocent he's done nothing to invite the dad would you stop looking at me like that I'm not I'm not looking at you I'm not like what did I do you know like just baffling emotional deeply emotional shit they're going through and how they come up with this stuff where you're the enemy and you've done nothing. That's right. And girls, girls are high drama, as I think with two of them, you've figured out. It'll be, yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting. And back to actually the writer and the director of that is hilarious. I, I, I recently Bo watched Burnham. his, yeah, yeah Bo, uh, Bo Burham. I recently watched his, one of his stand up routines and we were peeing our pants. He's a very, very intelligent weirdo. I mean, yeah, and, I, no, and I mean that I, with affection. I recommend that while they're now in what fifth grade, that fifth yeah. grade, yeah, that you've got a couple years, but brace yourself. Yeah, and it's the, it's the drama mainly. You of know? course, I mean it's it's the their world is so much smaller than you think it is. I remember my brother Bobby's got two girls, and his oldest was a little high maintenance in terms of the emotional craziness, and he said to me one day, "When oh my god, their social life is." everything i said are you saying that seriously you didn't know that <laughs> are you kidding me yep <laughs> yeah We're no i know a good job i think <laughs> we're getting a whiff of it we're getting a whiff of it i mean i'm yeah. i'm smitten with all my kids i mean the the, the the girls it's they the thing that i think is funny and i i, I have to actually stop myself or walk out of mm-hmm. the room sometimes when there's an emotional breakdown because i'm going to start laughing because oh, yeah. it's it's so dramatic. Like where oh. where is where is my brush? I can't find my brush. <laughs> and it's so, and I and I literally have to like bite my tongue of because course. I'm going to start laughing in front of their face, and that's not very kind and loving. But and my wife, both both of us have to do it. They'll literally, and I've actually been caught a few times, kind of like 
tattoo myself. And, but the problem is they're a team. And what ends up happening is I'll like turn or I'll turn away and like trying to like kind of snicker. And the other one goes, dad. And she catches me. The other, the twin catches oh me my God. snickering at her sister. And I'm like, God damn it. You too. Spread out. <laughs> <laughs> Spread out. <laughs> don't don't stand next to each other all the time. Double team. Yeah, Double seriously. Team. Seriously. But oh yeah, I mean God. they're they're pretty amazing and I mean my son is pretty much in this kind of like bullshit stage of his life right now where everything's just oh, yeah. oh my God, Dana Carvey. Oh my has, God, is that brilliant? Have you seen him? Oh, that's what I'm saying. It's bullshit. It's bullshit. Yeah, that's exactly what it sounded like. That's why it reminded me. Oh my God. It my I <laughs> fell out of my chair laughing when I heard him say that. And it's and I'll do that. I go because he talks like this he goes dad i don't sound like that i'm like yeah you do yeah, you do <laughs> you, you do dude i'm sorry he he takes real offense to it though and i have to be careful because my personality wants to mess with them you know like as a buddy you know but yeah. he's my oh, son no, no, yeah. he's my son yeah. he's 13 i can i can only be a dick so far <laughs> you know no you will you will bob bob bit his tongue for a lot of things and now they are they are best friends yeah. and uh they they went to the kevin hart stand-up show together yeah. and they can they talk all the time and you yeah. know he he lived with us since he was nine yeah and and it is just remarkable how he's he's now a grown-up and i can curse in front of him and we all love bill burr you know and it's just yeah it's this wonderful thing, but while you're going through it, you're literally walking to a room and either biting your tongue, like yeah. you say, yeah. or knocking your head into the wall. I mean, there's no in between. Yeah, it's 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 <laughs> it's brutal to deal with the the dumb factor. They there there's literally like physiological occurrences happening in their brain right now that have literally dumbed him down. And I don't mean that like he's a dumb person, but I think that there is physiological, biological, chemical reactions happening that evidently are, are factual that they literally are a little dumb right now as far as like choices and actions and re reflexes and how they do things when they do things i mean it, it's just that's what's going on and well it is it is it is actually physiological and i'll tell you how i know this because as a stepmother my hands were tied a lot in terms of what was going on in my own house and I dealt with this as a therapist who told me, and it was sort of good news in that it put it in perspective, but yeah. bad news in that I couldn't do anything about it. That's right. She said, there's a part of their frontal lobe That's right. in their brain that their ability to reason and be rational is not going to completely formulate mm -hmm. until they're at least 21. And this is like... He's at 15 or 16. So I'm like, you're telling me I've got five or six. More <laughs> so you're telling me? You kidding me? And he's got an excuse. Oh, yes. He's afraid. got an excuse. That's it. I know. It's very, very challenging. And I, I didn't even really think about it until, I, you know, before I had kids when somebody would say, oh, you know, he'd he, if his head wasn't attached, he'd lose it. You know what I mean? They, they say like, right, he'd, right. he'd lose his yeah, head if it weren't attached to his shoulders. Yeah. It's up his butt somewhere. It's absolutely you know? absolutely true at least no. in the experience with my son that he would forget his head if it wasn't attached oh, to his body. Oh, I, I, I can't even the boys are the worst with that. Boys there's a thing too where both my boys my husband and Max and I call it uh, look like a boy because they'll open the refrigerator and go we're out of milk. I'm like <laughs> you know, there's, there's a gallon jug like to the right against so I know the shelf. I know where it is. I can oh picture it in my head. And just the other day, you know, Bob's like, oh, wow, we're out of mayonnaise. I'm like, no, no, it's on the, the yeah. door shelf on the third one to the right. It might be behind the ketchup. Yeah. No, it's not here. Oh, so it's, it is, so, it's, it's, so it's a guy thing, not just a boy thing. That's a... actually that's actually a male female <laughs> thing that in terms of <laughs> spatial something. something. So I'll come in and go, I just told you the exact shelf. Yeah. I told you it was behind the ketchup. Yeah. And that's where it is. Where and it they're is. like, oh, wow. Okay. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. And it's, re and it's repetitive. And I'm, I mean, I experienced this with my son and he literally the other day asked me because he's like a complete junkie with Fortnite. I don't know if you're, you even know oh, what that is because oh, we talked about it on the radio. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you're, 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 I, my son is an addict. And so he was asking to buy something on it. I'm like, look, dude, you've got your own money. I'm not going to throw my money oh, in the garbage can. Driving people. Crazy. So yeah, I'm not going to throw the money in the garbage can. You've earned money doing what you 
earn money doing. And so if you want to blow your money, that's fine. So he was do it. And he's like, I'll give him a wallet. I was like, well, that's all. Well, where, where, where'd you put it? I go, where'd I put it? I, I, it's not my wallet. It's not my responsibility, man. This is your money. You have to take responsibility for it. This is not the first time you've lost your wallet. You know I mean? oh. Like he's lost a lot of money in his wallet. And so I was like trying to be calm about it. Right. And I was like, dude, you got to look around. And I happened to come downstairs 13 seconds. I found it. I mean, literally, oh, yeah. it was like, I, I didn't know where it was. I just looked for it, and mm-hmm. there it was. I said, oh, yeah. dude, where where, where did you look? Because I just yeah. found it. And he goes, <laughs> the thing is awesome, though, is thank God. I love him. When he does get caught like that, yeah, he knows it. And he's, he starts, uh, he kind of giggles. He's like, <laughs> like yeah, he's like, it's funny to you. He, 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 kinda, <laughs> he get, he gets it. He's like, Oh yeah, man, yeah. I was like, your dad, totally right. Dad. He doesn't say that, but he like the laughter lets me know that he knows that it was like, Oh man, I did it again. Not a good deal. Yeah. 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 Well, you, you'll, you'll brace yourself if he ever loses his cell phone, which Max did in the house. Oh. And he was old enough to be, uh, he was d- the teenage enough to be left on his own while we were out, wherever we were out. Yeah, yeah. I came back and he had turned all the furniture over in the house. <sighs> he was in a state of such <laughs> panic that I- I- I've never seen anything like it in my life. And the now, good too bad you didn't have a camera. Be- too bad you didn't have like cameras. Oh, in the house. I wish, I wish I'd see. Yeah. Like a, yeah. A, a spy video yeah. to, to play that back. God, but good um, the good news is we found all kinds of shit under the couch in the playroom, oh, including good. a petrified hot dog. It didn't, it, it was literally completely like a half a hot dog that was in, it was petrified like a fossil. It was, <laughs> so you have no funny. idea what you're going to find. No, I know. But I've never seen a kid so spastic in my life. That's funny. Over his cell phone. So, um, so a uh, couple, 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 couple questions before we, we wrap up. I, I yeah, wanted to sir. ask you is, and you can think of one, and if you're not ready to answer it, you can think of the other one. But how would you define, as eloquently as possible, how would you define mm-hmm. a breakthrough? And are there, I ask this with all the guests, are there right. any books that you, or movies, or you know, anything that you've read or watched or listened to lately that you tend to share with people about? Mm, wow. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> God, there's probably so many things that have crossed my path that I either write down or save or something like that, that, mm-hmm. you know, I think are going to carry me through the day. That's right. What they are off the top of my head. I'm not. Is there so anybody, sure. is there anybody, is there anybody in particular who you like, if you saw them, like a documentary that you're going to see of them or somebody you listen to on the radio and you're like, Oh, that guy, I love listening to him or her or an author. Sure. No, I know. I know they're they're out there. I'm just trying to to think here of who that would be. Yeah, that's such a good question, Jordan. Uh, <laughs> um, I think I think. Well, let me go back to the first one. Okay, I think, great. I, I think a breakthrough, like when we started out talking about this, I, I think it can take on many forms. It could be small. Like mine feels like it was it was a a, a period of growth that ended up with. Not quite an aha, but like, okay, I get it now. You know, I know me better. I know, you know, I I know who I am more now and I can, I can go forward much more strongly in my life, you know, not, not making the choices I made before because I know better. I'm not sure that's really clear. No, no, no. I think what I I hear at least is Mm -hmm. there's your experience of a breakthrough allows for you to have increased self-awareness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and be more my own person and be in my own skin more comfortably, which, yeah. you know, is, was a very hard thing for me. I was not, you know, I, I think that's what we talked about earlier. I was not a competent kid on the inside of people on the outside thought, oh, she's got it all going on. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, I don't. Most of us don't. Most, <laughs> most of us, us don't. Most, most of us, us don't. don't. We're just better at pre- pretending than others. Right. Right. I mean, you look at, um, unfortunately, this epidemic of what social media is. I mean, social media is just nothing but a a show it's uh, yeah look at I, look so at how great I, my life is uh, while really i mean if anybody really really honestly shared their lives entirely on instagram or facebook they'd be let's just say this you'd be a very different experience it'd be a different different world not bad but it would be not all 
cocktails and vacations no, and right, right, right. you know uh, ex- you know concerts in the park and extraordinary events i mean there are people who obviously we know who are uber successful and they're always working on television or films things like that and they have this like constant stream of quote unquote success mm-hmm. but everyone 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 has these has off days, has terrible days, has down days. Of course, you don't see them. Course. You don't see them usually publishing on those days. <laughs> uh, ain't that the truth? They don't publish on those days. Uh, you know, and occasionally, and the thing is, occasionally you do. And what's so great is when somebody literally just pulls their pants down and shares. It it <laughs> it literally attracts more likes than probably anything they've shared that month. Oh sure, oh sure. Um, it's honesty. I, I think the, the the word for me there is vulnerability, and I totally. think that has been that um, another reason why sketch comedy worked for me better than acting. Even though I I think I'm a decent actor, but I you know vulnerability is a hard place for me to get to. Even though I am that person, as we all are, but being okay with being vulnerable is really hard. You know, it was always, again, you know, that good girl thing of you, you don't have any soft spots, you know, you got this, you got this. No, I don't. Quite frankly, I don't. (laughs) So, um, I don't know. I, I think every now and then I'll read something about, you know, like somebody who's faced a challenge either physically or life things. And, and they could be just stories, you know, those feel good stories that you read, that kind of keep your life in perspective, like, oh, at least I don't have that going on. Right. You know, right. Um, I really wish I had something off the top of my head. No, that's okay. You know what? Here's the, here, well, here's the thing. It's all good uh, because we can edit this thing. So as yes. far as <laughs> as far as, you know, you sharing with me uh, something that is a breakthrough and like the definition, the definition of a breakthrough is fantastic. When it comes to sharing with me about a book, the thing actually is that the the whole book question has been something i've done newly right and and right. some and some guests just kind of readily share books just because mm-hmm. it comes up in conversation and so i started gathering all the guests book su- suggestions and mm-hmm. now on my website i have a section that says recommended reading uh-huh. which is categorized by the guest and what books they suggested but there's actually a recommended reading list on the website that you can find the whole whole group of them and so it's one of those things where i've actually texted people after the fact who didn't tell me about a book and said hey because you know sometimes on the spot you're like oh sure you know (laughs) so let me let me interject something that's been my situation with that is that you know i've been prone to you know buy the latest self-help improve yourself, get over your fears, do whatever right. kind of thing. And I'll read them and they make sense, but it's kind of like going to, um, a seminar, you yep. know, and, yep. and I've been to them and you know about that world. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and I remember somebody saying, okay, they're great and they do good for people, but what happens when you get out of that room That's right. and you don't have the cheering rah, rah, sis, boom, ba right. thing that you're in the same room with people all wanting their their version of the same thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel like I've got to make, I, I, I know the, I know how it works. I have to make it work for me. And sometimes I'll get partway through a book and go, I've read this in some way, shape Mm -hmm. or form Mm -hmm. all of my life. And I, I'm not learning anything new here. It's Mm -hmm. a matter of acting on it. That's right. That's, that's that's the, that's the key. Yeah. And and honestly, that's, it's it is that simple. Unfortunately, it's not always that easy, but it is that simple. The, con- that, the concept is very easy. Completely, to grasp. yeah. It's, it's the doing. That's right. right. I mean, right. you can just by listening to a seminar or a podcast or reading a great book is great. It's a it's a it's a jumping off point. But right. you, it, for me at least, it's really been how do I how do I get the rubber to meet the road? And I've got yeah, to actually exactly. I have to put it into action, and mm-hmm. I actually have to put it into action. Because I've coached people and that's great. But, you know, my life experience is part of my uh, rubber meets the road, you know, uh, sure. uh, you know, so I can say Look, this happened to me and this is what I did as a result of that. And I had, a, I had a success as a result of that. But right. the 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 day to day was something that I really didn't. I mean, I had parts of my life where I would do whether it was journaling or meditation and I would do it on a regular basis. And then I didn't. And then I did. And then I didn't. And I remember about two and a half years ago, I kind of got to a point where I was like, you know what? I'm kind of sick and tired of being sick and tired. Kind of like, Uh, kind of 
kind of tired of like you said, like I've read this before. I've seen this before. I know yeah, better. I know it. better. <laughs> I know better. But but yeah. here I am, not entirely fulfilled. I am I have a blessed life. I'm I have so much to be grateful for, right? Mm-hmm. But but it's like, what's next? How am I gonna push or break through again, right, to the next level? And right. And and I have no one to blame. And because it's it's no it's no use blaming anybody else. I've done yeah. that and I it doesn't work. <laughs> and so I'm what can I do? And I really realized that I looked back and I said, There have been periods in my life where I've soared. There have been periods in my life where I've been like humming. Why, yeah. w- what happened? And what I was able to deduce was what we're saying, which is I stopped practicing. I stopped yeah. participating. Yeah. I yeah. was expecting something to happen, waiting for something to happen, and then pissed off that things weren't happening, and, right. which is my fault. And so I literally had to consciously take one of these ritual or practices that you know I'd, I'd used and say, you know what, I'm going to reintroduce this into my my day in it with with, with mm-hmm. discipline, with discipline, and not in a way of like I always kind of had this experience of discipline as being a pain in the ass, but but. When it's connected to something that lights you up and turns you on, it's practice. It's it is. It's, it's one of the, one of the first things I did when we lost the job was I made myself. It's right here in front of my computer, Marianne's to do list to help conquer those long days of unemployment. And they're real simple things, yeah. but uh, I have ten of them, and I check off at least half of them every day, and it keeps me going. And it's my own version of that book. It's, it's right. the real life version. Because well, you, you're 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 plucking you're plucking from the knowledge that's been around for a long time. Anybody sure, who's written sure. books the, the, is the stealing from other people. It's using them. Yeah. You know, it's it's like learning things uh in therapy and then one day you don't need the therapist anymore. You're like, Okay, I I, I, I got the tools, now yeah. I have to put them to work without spending two hundred dollars on you. That's right. So. <laughs> that's right. I'm a because 'cause I'm, cause I'm a big boy. I, yeah. I yeah. I one one of the ones that I have a couple of things also on my I guess what you would call your to do list, which it's easy to forget. But thank God, like because I kind of put it into a practice, it's like brushing my teeth, you know, or, or like having my coffee in the morning. I don't think about having right. coffee in the morning. I have coffee in the morning. So is listing three to five things I'm grateful for, and yes. really writing them down, writing it yeah, down. Gratitude is is really an important yeah. element. Look yeah. at it. Be present to it. And you don't yep. have to spend your entire day, you know, being a, a Buddhist monk. But if you can plug in, like, you, you know, a couple minutes and just kind of kind of dip no, into it's, that space. It's, it's, you know, and, and we all bite off too much of that expecting big changes quickly. That's right. And it just doesn't work that way. And, and the frustration factor <laughs> kicks in pretty quickly. That, that's right. Yeah. But it, yeah. it, it is. And it, it, it takes something to kind of, you know, manage the ebbs and the flows. The, you it know, does. it's like... It's most of the work is it's like, do your work in the valleys. The hills will take care of themselves. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. You know, it's like this is the work you're you're now in the place of, OK, it's time to go to work. It's time to time. To, not, right. not, not that you go to sleep when you're, you know, soaring high, but this is a different experience. It's easy to a certain degree to to have these experiences of gratitude and joy and fulfillment when things are going the way you want them to go. The oh tough, no! Yes, the tough yes. part is when things aren't necessarily going the way you want them to go, yeah. and accepting and having grace in that space. And one of the other thing, the other things that I will also do is do one nurturing event for yourself each day. There I have number ten: indulge. <laughs> I love it. Out movie and finally carbohydrates. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Donuts. <laughs> carbohydrates that's a broad Any statement form of carbohydrates that's yes. funny it's a very broad a broad environment of it's, food not it's just in donuts letters. it's the only thing on here that's in capital letters that's so. that's hilarious <laughs> carbohydrates <laughs> but these are things that these are things that it's really easy to forget especially when you're feeling down and when you're not feeling of course your, that's your the best. hardest you know I try to think of what my father said, and you know, he was a depression era kid, so he knew some tough times. And uh, he said, the, "The worse things got, the bigger the party I threw." You know, so wow. celebrating life in the moment. Yep, that's it. Celebrating yep, life, it is. and they're like, full circle back to being present, right? 
Yeah, full circle. That's yeah, that's true. That's Look- true. <laughs> Well, Marianne, you and I, obviously, and I say this with just about every guest who I have, and this is why I love doing this podcast, is we could go on and on. But thank you so much for for taking some time. Oh, this was a blast. Yeah, yeah. this is great. And um, thank you all for listening to another episode of Breakthroughs with Jordan Murphy. Uh, we'll see you next time. Today's episode is sponsored by Audible.com and Amazon Fresh. Check out those promotional giveaways on the front page of my website. Stay tuned for more episodes of Breakthroughs with Jordan Murphy. Check out my website at BreakthroughsWithJordanMurphy.com. Stay connected on Instagram at BreakthroughsWithJordan and Twitter at Jordan D. Murphy. And if you have a great story to share, as I'm sure many of you do, go to my website at BreakthroughsWithJordanMurphy.com and shoot me an abbreviated version of your story to my email. I'll give it a read and maybe share a couple of them on the show. 